After its coupe and convertible, BMW now presents its Grand Coupe, the first four-door coupe in the brand's history. We're testing the 640i with the 235 kilowatt engine. This version has a six-cylinder inliner under the hood. There's also an optional eight-cylinder with fuel injection, if you prefer. BMW's Peter Tunemann says the company's introducing the six-cylinder version on June 2nd, the 640i and 640d. The eight-cylinder will be launched in summer and hit the market in the third quarter as the 650i, also as an all-wheel drive. The 640i's exterior is striking for its aggressive yet sleek lines. Xenon headlights are standard, or you can choose the adaptive LED lights instead. Horizontal lines stretch the silhouette and make for a tough-looking back end. The third brake light is a line of LEDs. The Grand Coupe's trunk opens automatically. Cargo volume is 460 liters, but fold down the back seats and the cargo area expands to 1265 liters, ample space for bulky objects. Inside again, the Grand Coupe gives a sense of roominess. The controls are sensibly organized and simple to operate. The onboard computer includes several suspension options that can help save fuel. Nearly the whole interior is lined with fine light-colored leather. Above the navigation monitor, you'll find the Bang and Olufsen high-end surround sound system. The seats provide optimal driving comfort. Passengers in back have enough leg room too. The back seats are equipped with a seat heating system. And on the road, the car wows drivers with its precise handling and cutting edge technology. Peter Tunemann says the long wheelbase and extended footprint harmonize beautifully with the car's electromagnetic steering. The suspension switch allows the car to be put into a highly economical driving mode. The car doesn't just act dynamic, it is dynamic. The 640i can harness 235 kilowatts of power and sprints from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 5.4 seconds. Maximum speed is electronically pegged at 250. Official fuel consumption is 7.7 .7 liters of gasoline, which is pretty economical for a car this heavy. Peter Tunemann says that buyers for this car, at least according to market research, are mostly men between 40 and 50 years old and top earners who want to set themselves apart. They choose it for the special design, the luxurious comfort. It's simply a high-end car, the 6 Series Coupe, and it's beautifully functional too. So much luxury has its price. The 640i Grand Coupe lists for 79,500 euros in Germany. Volkswagen has a new kit on the block, a GTI convertible. The sporty Golf Cabriolet features a two liter TSI engine. That makes the car a true cruising convertible. It takes just 7.3 seconds to make the dash from 0 to 100. The Golf GTI Cabriolet retails for just over 31,000 euros in Germany.
Citroën has also launched a new model, the C4 Aircross. The compact SUV is only 4.34 meters from stem to stem. It comes with a gasoline engine that puts out 86 kilowatts, or two diesel versions that generate 84 and 100 kilowatts of power respectively. The price tag in Germany starts at just under 24,000 euros. Not long ago, electric cars were exotic novelties, but now they're taking over the streets. One of the first to go into mass production was the Nissan Leaf. It was introduced in Japan and the US in December 2010, and soon after in many European countries. Now it's coming to Germany too. The company's plant in Zunderland, England, is already producing batteries and series production is scheduled to begin there early next year. The expansion of series production is the culmination of years of development, especially in the batteries. Nissan's Florian Wunsch explains that the company takes an integrated approach to electromobility. They've spent 20 years developing and refining e-car battery technology. That battery was the foundation for the Nissan LEAF. The company also puts a premium on making electromobility work. Their partnership with German utility RWE shows Nissan's commitment to extending the charging infrastructure and achieving the goal of zero emission mobility in Germany and worldwide. The interior also benefits from Nissan's attention to detail. It has a clean, modern feel. The digital dashboard is high-tech, but easy to operate. And the shift lever also has a futuristic look. A colorful dash display includes all the information the driver needs about power use. A touch display can show the car's range on a map for added convenience. The car's 48 lithium-ion modules, each comprised of four battery cells, are mounted under the floor, a space-saving solution. That means the LEAF has a decent amount of legroom, more even than some of its conventional competitors. The trunk is roomy too. The designers didn't need to compromise on cargo space. On the contrary, there's even extra storage in the compartments underneath. That adds up to a capacity of 680 liters all told. More than enough for day-to-day -day needs. The Leaf starts with a press of a button. There are two driving modes, standard for a more spirited drive and an eco mode for longer range. With a snappy 280 newton meters of torque, the car's brisk acceleration adds to the fun. The 80 kilowatt electric engine lets the Leaf sprint to 100 in a hair under 12 seconds. Maximum speed is 145 kilometers an hour, and the maximum range clocks in at about 175 kilometers. Florian says the LEAF is essentially the same as an ordinary car. In an ordinary car, though, you make a quick stop at the gas station, and that's it. In an electric vehicle, the energy the car needs is instead delivered to your home. That's where the infrastructure is. And charging the battery takes a lot longer. But again, you can do it at home. It's a minor change, but an adjustment nonetheless. Charging the battery is a cinch, but the charging network in Germany is still in its infancy. Energy provider RWE has just over a thousand charging stations set up nationwide. In 18 months, they're planning to have around 4,000. The quick charge stations are especially useful when you're on the road. They just take 30 minutes to bring the battery to 80% of capacity. The charger recognizes the car and its owner automatically as soon as the cable is connected. Another bonus, the public RWE charging stations use only green electricity. 
Florian says there are three main charging modes. The one used most often is the charging device at the driver's home. Then there's also the quick charge station, which is much like a gas pump. That gives 50 kilowatts of power output, so a charge takes just 30 minutes. The third option is the emergency charging device, which you can use at any good power outlet in a pinch. But Florian says the best option is still the home charging device, because it's both convenient and secure. Soon the LEAF will be joined by the NV200 van, which Nissan plans to also offer in an electric version. Some cars become legends in their own right. There's the Citroën DS with its avant-garde body style, or the iconic Porsche 911. Mercedes had the 300 SL with gullwing doors. It brought so much glamour to the brand marked with a star that the Stuttgart-based company has resurrected it as the SLS. The E-Type is Jaguar's vintage idol. But how did the British muscle car attain legendary status? Vintage dealer Burkhard Stein says that from the start it caused a commotion. The price-power ratio was sensational because it cost the half of what a Ferrari or Maserati did. But the design was the real surprise. The E-Type was developed on the racetrack. Its predecessor, the D-Type, was successful at Le Mans. It was the first Jaguar with a monocoque chassis. On March 15, 1961, the E-Type Coupe made its media debut at the Geneva Motor Show. The response to the futuristic car was generally positive. Orders for 500 E-Types were booked in Geneva alone. Yet before the show, there was dramatic uncertainty about the car's premiere. It was finished late, and test driver Norman Dewis had to burn his way down from Coventry to Geneva with the showroom model. I left Coventry at quarter to eight in the evening, and I was there for 10 to 10 following morning. Uh, so 11 hours, and the average speed was 60 mile an, 68 mile an hour for the whole trip. A number of technical innovations also premiered with the E-Type. The newly developed rear axle was in use until the mid-1990s, when it was standard in the Jaguar XJ. Norbert Schroeder says the rear axle gave it great handling. He explains the design eliminated certain leaf springs and distributed less of the car's weight on the wheels, yet the way it still gripped the road helped make it a legend. And then there was the body, which was part of the streamlining revolution of the 1960s. Es ist das Gesamtkonzept. Norbert Schroeder says the entire design, including the structure of the monocoque, were groundbreaking. The interior was in what's known as a well, and the front had a supporting frame. From the start, they were certain there would be more than six cylinders, and that's how the shape emerged. Und so kam letztlich uh, diese Formation raus. The first engines came from the car's predecessor, the XK150S. It could deliver 265 horsepower, that's 193 kilowatts, and had torque of 348 newton meters. And the shape couldn't have suited the 60s better. Malcolm Sayer conceived the design, but in creating the E-Type, the aeronautical engineer's aim was dictated solely by function rather than form. The astonishingly long hood concealed a straight six-cylinder engine. Even today, it's still a thrill to sit behind the wheel and see the hood stretch away before you. The car went through three significant series. 
The final one had a 5.3 liter 12 cylinder under the hood. The upgrade became necessary after the US tightened emission standards, which reduced the power that could be delivered by the six. At first, the 12 cylinder was supposed to be exclusively for the track. Known as the XJ13, the car was supposed to race at Le Mans, but that never happened. While making a film to promote the car, the rear wheel of the E-Type Series 3 came off. Norman Dewis's prototype crashed and was rebuilt only recently. The more recent 12-cylinder Jags were designed for comfort and to appeal to Americans. Power steering, automatic transmissions, and air conditioning were standard in the Series 3. In fact, 70% of all the E-Types built at the time were exported to America. The Jags' sexy 60 image has helped the car secure icon status and even its own place at New York's Museum of Modern Art. <laughs>